Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We will start in just a minute, but I just wanted to say a reminder to turn off your cell phones. Turn off your ringers, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the English are supposed to be. Hello. I think, I think Lisa wanted to tell people not to use cell phones. I think she had to say something. Yeah. Hello. You're having too much fun, yes. No, I was going to say the English are supposed to be famous for punctuality, but since it's seven minutes past the hour, we might begin. <laughs> uh, Anyway, again, thank you for coming, with some of you, a third time in this marathon celebration. It's very, very, uh, very kind of you to come. And, um, you know, you, you'll just be eavesdropping on a conversation about travel between me. I'm Nigel McGilchrist, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, and Susie also whom many of you know, but some of you uh, may not do. And Susie, in the last 10 years of my life, has become a very dear and close friend and is without doubt, without doubt, the best colleague, the most congenial colleague I've ever had in my working career. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Well, as you can imagine, I have a very hard time with Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Susie Orso? This is the question I put to myself 12 years ago, um, before I knew her, because I heard a lot about her before I'd, I'd met her. Who is Susie Orso? Um, who are you, Susie? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> My story of coming into connection with the, with the museum comes from Pico Iyer, somebody that you know, many of you here, because his parents lived in the community, were uh, academics here. And uh, Pico put me in touch with somebody that he said was his dearest friend here, and a wonderful person called Shelley Ruston. And more about Shelley in a moment, this elegant lady who is behind me and also in front of me at the back of the auditorium there. More of that in a moment. But Pico, who was at university with me and who I've known for a long time, put me in touch with Shelley. And uh, Shelley, bless her, picked up the ball and put me in touch with Jill Finston, who at that time was running a wonderful educational program here. Jill also at the back of the auditorium there. Yeah. <laughs> and Jill took a punt on me because Shelley had said, well, try Nigel, and Pico had said to Shelley, try Nigel. And anyway, my, my, my relationship began, and Shelley very sweetly asked me if I would think of doing a travel a, a journey uh, for the museum one time. And uh, I agreed to do that. And over the first couple of, of years of my working with the museum, um, many people, Jill mentioned uh, Susie to me, Shelley mentioned Susie to me, many other people mentioned Susie, Susie, Susie. And rather like a little child at a party, 
you know, when you're taken to your party at the age of six by your parents and the grown-ups are in one area and you're sort of not seeing anyone and your mother says, now, come on, darling, um, I think you should talk to that very nice girl in the corner there. <laughs> People kept saying to me, you must... Meet Susie, you just, and I say, no, 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 I don't, no, I don't, I, I, why do I need to meet Susie also? We met, and the rest is history. We see so much to eye to eye on things that it's a real pleasure uh, working with Susie always, organizing tours. And as I say, I've never had a more congenial, uh, a more congenial colleague to work with. But our conversation here, and neither Susie and I, nor I would be here, nor none of us in this room here talking about this, were it not for Shelley Ruston, who very sweetly has come today. Uh, she has a busy life, and, uh, but she's come and she's at the back uh, of the auditorium there because Shelley, 50 years ago, had the foresight and the brilliant idea to open the museum out to other places and other experiences and to create a travel program. And there are many ways you can create a travel program. Um, and most of the travel programs that are available are you know, recreational and fairly banal, but that's not the sort of thing that Shelley does. Shelley is a person of great depth and great empathy and great interest and curiosity. And she created a way of traveling a way of seeing the world which takes people who are interested in art, as you all are because of your connection with the museum, out uh, to see and to understand art in other places. And it's been a privilege for both Susie and I to work in this program. And you know, our most important thing is thanks, first of all, to Shelley and to honor her for starting this 50 years ago. So a big round of applause for, 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 for Shelley. And bless you. Thank you, thank you for coming, uh, Shelley. The team, there's a, I took that picture of Shelley from, uh, from there. There's Teresa, who took in the center, um, took over at a certain point for seven, seven years. She was running the program when Shelley was wanting to, to step out. And there, of course, is our indomitable Lisa in the front there, who now runs it. And, uh... and I would just like to say a few words about Lisa. I've loved working with Shelley. And Shelley was wanting to retire. And she thought, well, who's going to take over the program? And she told us when we went to see Shelley a couple of days ago, when she met Lisa, and had started working with her, she knew she could retire. So that's an enormous tribute to Lisa, who's incredibly hardworking, always ready to pick up the phone, deal with problems, and nobody could be more dedicated. So thank you, Lisa, for all you do. Oh, sure. on, to on top of being a mother and yeah, everything raising two time. children, how do you uh, have time to do that? <laughs> But later on, I hope Lisa will come up and join us and help answer questions and uh, expand our discussion later on. But I, I just wanted to begin, if I may, to sort of set the ball rolling by talking a little bit about the nature of travel and how travel should be, because as I said a moment ago, there are many different kinds of travel. And um, I, the recipe that... Shelley created and has given us, and that we've done our best to, to carry on, and I hope gives pleasure to you all, is a special one. Because, you know, I mean, there's recreational travel in which you go and you sit on a beach and you unwind and you relax and you don't think about very much. And the idea of the travel is not to think about very much. And we all need that kind of travel from time to time. Life is far more stressful every decade that passes for us. And uh, we need that kind of recreational break. And that's not the kind of travel, obviously, that the museum uh, offers, which is a travel um, of, of exploration. And this is, what, uh, uh, this, is what, this is what real, real cultural and intelligent travel is about. 
exploration and discovering that there are worlds and ways of being that are different from our own. Now, people often say, you know, yes, well, travel is good because you, uh, you know, you see, you see other customs and other ways of doing things. It's more than that. And, and, and George uh, very kindly sort of reminded that me that I'd said something similar in the book about Pythagoras on that, that you don't just travel just to see other ways of people, you know, dressing and eating and living, but you do it because other peoples and other cultures have different ways of conceiving of the world, the same things that that, that uh, we have to deal with. They have different methods of co cognition, sometimes radically different. If one goes to a country like Japan, say, there is a world and a, a philosophy of life. I mean, everything is a philosophy of life in Japan, like in almost in no other country. And to travel there and to begin to see that there are these other ways of conceiving of the world uh, is very, very, uh, is, is wonderful for us. And when you go to a place, um, I mean, I, I, I remember this. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I live in the Greek world. I, I've devoted my life to that. I studied Greek at school, but it was an entirely abstract thing. Mm -hmm. And when I first went to the Mediterranean and saw the light and the sea and saw, it suddenly all started to make sense, the geography speaks. So it's very important to do this, to this kind of travel. It's a privilege that we in this room are able to do it. And it's a huge uh, gift to be able to, uh, to, to travel and to understand other people. It's only a force, uh, force for good. Um, so, and... Uh, you know, we, we have tried as much as possible to, in this program, to avoid travel. Does anybody this know nature. what that is? Yes. Can anybody guess? It, no. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's the escalator of the to Vatican. Heaven. Vatican museums. So when you go into the Vatican, yes, you go up there. There are 20,000 people a day visiting the Vatican museums. And I think probably a few of you here have actually seen the Sistine Chapel and the Vatican Museums on your own, organized through the museum. On and the that's a totally different experience. So it's things like that that the museum has tried to give you, give you experiences. So it's not just visual, but to experience being in a space, not being distracted and pushed around by or having loudspeakers saying you're not allowed to take pictures in this in the Sistine Chapel. And these are things that people never forget. So again, a tribute to the museum for trying to do very special visits and giving you these experiences. Yes, very important. Because, yes, I mean, your experience, I mean, how can you look at art when you're doing it in this way? I mean, who was I talking with just yesterday about seeing the, uh, going to the Louvre? It's becoming, as Henry, you were saying it's absolutely impossible to go to the Louvre mm. anymore, really. There are so many people. And I have a photograph, which I should have put up there. I haven't sort of brought it with me. But when I last saw, the last time I saw the Mona Lisa, and she's somebody I've seen many times in night, yeah. I just took a photograph of the people taking a photograph of <laughs> the, the uh, because... It's all like that. The Mona Lisa is there, and everybody's turned away because they're doing a selfie of themselves with the yeah. Mona Lisa. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's what we, we try, to, try to avoid. But also we try to give, obviously, depth to, to the history, to the travel by talking about, I mean, think the geography that you, you, you... As I said about my discovery of the, of the Greek world and the Mediterranean world, when you see the geography, you see the light, you understand the difficulty or the pleasure or the problems or the seas that they had to be coped with in, in living in a certain place, um, you begin to understand why that culture is the way it is, where, why it has become what it is uh, now, and, and, and this is the value of what we tried to do. I mean, here's Egypt, obviously, a, a recent tour that we have done, but until you see this little strip of 
intense fertility in the middle of a continent of arid sand. And you realize the, 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 the closeness of it, the richness of that, the, the, the protection that the desert formed. You, you don't begin to understand why Egypt is this unchanging, or was historically unchanging and monolithic. Uh, civilization that it is very, very different from a Greek one, for example, which it lives, it create, grew in this uh, world in which people had nothing to cultivate. How do you cultivate these rocks? Uh, this sea is not the calm, flowing Nile. Therefore, it created a mindset quite, quite different from uh, uh, the Egyptian one, one of challenge, one of being stretched, one of problem solving, quite different from the, uh, um, the, the, the placid world of, 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 of Egypt. And then, you know, we've traveled to Bhutan somewhere. B Bhutan, if you haven't been, I know the uh, Santa Barbara is planning a trip. It is something that is sort of really leaves a deep impression on you. A country of 750,000 people, it's nothing. And yet they have so much dignity. A lot of them live out in the mountains and have a very hard life. It really is a very, very special place. Himalayas behind. It's a country between China and India, squeezed between these colosses. And they've maintained their traditions. Um, and the way of life and dignity, enormous dignity. What would you say about yes, yeah. I mean, one of my very, very favorite uh, desti destinations. And I mean, it, it's uh, an example of a country which it is possible to live in the 21st century without sacrificing everything to materialism. And, mm. uh, and I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's wonderfully edifying. This is what I mean about differences in cognition. I mean, it really. It, it helps us understand that the same world, the same things that we're dealing with, can be approached and viewed and contemplated in an entirely uh, different way. And they've been thinking about ecology and sustainability yes. a lot. Much longer. Than much that. longer. Mm. Um, the five kings are, that have, have all traveled to the West, but they've seen the good and the bad. And so they maintain their traditions, but also are very aware of how these traditions can be spoiled. So they stopped smoking before, I think, most Western countries. Really? Yeah. They prohibited smoking, yes. Wonderful place. It is. And of course, I mean, we, we, we are as a community a museum, and therefore the art and architecture and sculpture that we see is a very important thing. And, and that's something that you can only understand once you see the landscape out of which that tradition of painting or architecture rose. And this is a photograph from a trip we did together uh, 10 years, no, no. no five years, 2017, I think. Five years ago to Holland mm. and, um, and the Low Countries, uh, sort of Flemish painting, Dutch painting. And, you know, you see those landscapes like that with these magnificent clouds and high skies and then you begin to understand Rysdale's paintings. This is not, it's not I could have chosen a better example of one with the huge sort of open skies that he, uh, that he loved. And on that trip, we, I can't, there, there, there was somebody, I mean, Susie knows all these people and finds them, I don't know how, it, it was a complete astonishment to me that we went and had dinner in this This family. is a, a wonderful private visit that we mm. had, and those beautiful trees. It belongs to the, the Van der Elsts, and it's very close to Bruges, a wonderful city again, beautifully preserved because the, the, the river silted up. And it's very like the painting you've just seen, this wonderful feeling of, of the sky and the landscape. And this was their garden, which is phenomenal. Uh, in an area where, you know, the out, once you leave, I mean, Bruges is a beautiful center, but once you go out, it's not, in like many cities, not terribly attractive. And the idea that there was this beautiful garden and mm. it, uh, house uh, w w was amazing to me. 
And those trees, I mean, they're almost like a sort of Corro painting. Yes. Wonderful. But how the wind sweeps in over the, the flat countryside. We, we've, you know, I mean, we've touched on some different places, uh, Bhutan and, uh, and uh, uh, Egypt and, and, and the, the, north, the low countries. But I think probably, understandably, Italy uh, sort of garners more tours. Yes. From, from the museum for obvious reasons. Yes, in fact, as you know, Nigel has two tours this year. But I looked up, and I'm not sure that you're aware that of UNESCO World Heritage Sites, Italy is the country that has the most number of sites, 58 sites, out of one, oh, just over 1,000. And Sicily has seven. So that's more than 10% are actually in Sicily. So those who are going for the first time, and I know many of you have been, and Sicily has always been a recurrent uh, theme. In Very fact, popular. the first tour I think I did, and I, I was to Sicily in just about 2000, the first tour I did with Nigel was to Sicily. And to many people I've spoken, they say Sicily has probably been one of their most exciting tours for the variety, the variety that you get in Sicily. And Nigel will talk a little bit about the history. Its position, of course, in the middle of the Mediterranean. You've got Turkey and Greece to the east, Spain to the west, Africa south of Sicily, and... Um, and Italy, I mean, Sicily is part of Italy, but it really is a region of its own, wouldn't you say, Nigel? Absolutely, yeah. And being in the middle of the, I mean, the Mediterranean itself, I mean, obviously, Italy is a particular um, magnet for art tourism and architecture tourism, historical tourism, but the whole Mediterranean, I mean, the Mediterranean is an extraordinary phenomenon because, but for three or four kilometers, well, actually a bit more, 10 kilometers at the Straits of Gibraltar, it's a lake, basically. It's an inland lake uh, fed by waters coming from, you know, Ukraine and Russia there into the Black Sea, throwing through the Bosporus, the Nile down here. But basically, it's a lake. And as such, it was a, it was like the, let's call it the sort of main, it, it was like the square, the platea, the plaza, the piazza, whatever you want, of early civilization, Egypt, the Near East, Asia Minor. Italy, Greece, North Africa, Spain, all of them rather like houses that are gathered around a main square. And the Mediterranean was the thing that connected them. And people moved across it. And it was like the main square of civilization. And right plumb in the middle, like the fountain in the middle of the square, is, is Sicily. Yeah. And of course, travel was much easier by sea, sea than by land. Than by land. land so, so obvious. And this is why. And the amazing thing about Sicily is that you have evidence of all the peoples who came through. Um, in other countries, quite often they've been, they've done away with the old buildings. But in Sicily, you start with the wonderful Greek temples, which to a certain extent, some of them are better preserved than the ones in Greece. And I remember taking a Greek to Sicily, and he was spellbound. And then you have the wonderful Roman mosaics. You have the Arab uh, Byzantine mosaics. You have Norman architecture. You have a bit of everything right up to, to yeah. the present day. So it is an amazing country, and it, people have misconceptions, preconceptions. Obviously, it has had a lot of bad press. I'm sure you've all heard they've just arrested mm -hmm. one of the top mafia people who's been on the run for 30 years, but living a perfectly normal life in a town, obviously being protected. But anyway, I don't know quite. I think he's ill. That's why he decided he'd had enough of it. But um, anyway, Sicily does have that side. But I think all of you who have been there have seen what an incredible place it is and how, how kind the people are and how good the food is, too. Oh, food is terrific. I, I had to write an encyclopedia entry on the history of Sicilian cuisine, and it was one of the most edifying things I've ever done because the roots of 
Italian and therefore French, and uh, you know what we understand of as Mediterranean um, cuisine all come from from Sicily, which obviously has huge input from Persia through the Arabs who colonized it, early the Greeks who settled there. You know, so there's there's elements that you can trace back to some of the cheeses that go back to G, uh, to, uh, to to Greece, then the um, obviously the egg plants that uh, came from Persia, pasta, which almost certainly was first made in one form in Persia and was brought by the Arabs into uh, Sicily. Rice as well first came into Europe, into Sicily. Almonds. Oranges and lemons. Oranges and lemons. Pistachios, all these things. They squeeze into, into Europe through Sicily. Their stepping stone is that little red blob in the middle of the sea. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, one of the lovely, I mean, thing where I think in Sicily, I can't remember whether Syracuse is our first stop. I think it is. I mean, there in the center of Syracuse in this lovely square, beautiful square, where uh, thanks to Susie's connections, we actually have a dinner uh, with a sort of, and then there's a balcony afterwards in which one can view this lovely uh, square on which there is the cathedral there. You, you approach the cathedral. It looks like a typically 17th, 18th century Baroque southern facade. And if you just sneak round the side, you begin to notice that the side is ribbed with Greek Doric columns, which go back to the 6th century BC. And along the top are Arab crenellations, like that. So the building has been there. Cicero talks a lot about this building, and the Roman writer, um, though it was already in a building 400 years old by the time he was writing about it. Uh, he talk, tells us how mar marvelous it was and how he'd had a statue of Athena on the top which reflected the sun out to sea so that sailors could see it. And then it was turned into a, a mosque um, by the Arabs, built those crenellations, and finally into a Christian church. And when you go inside, there's the Madonna and child next to a good pagan Doric column. I mean, it's an extraordinary building, a cathedral inside a, Roman, a Greek temple. Yes, and, and it's so easily done because you had the columns. You fill in between the columns, and you've got a nave, and you create a church. And that's also why the Temple of Concord in Agrigento is so well preserved because it was transformed into a church. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Parthenon in Athens also has been a mosque and a church and, mm -hmm. and a, now a museum. So the whole, been through the whole lot. But I suppose um, you know one of the loveliest things about Sicily is it's simply its beauty it's, as a landscape and it's extraordinary landscape. I mean, nothing is nothing is ordinary in Sicily. I mean, nothing, the society, the wine, the food, everything is highly complex and highly charged, including the landscape and the, the geology. Here is the biggest and most active volcano in Europe, Mount Etna, which, when you view it from this hotel, which those of you who are coming to uh, Sicily will stay in the Villa Timeo, one of the one of the great hotels of Italy, I would have thought. Certainly yes. one of the most expensive, unfortunately. But, I mean, one of, one of the great hotels. Yes, one of... The, I mean, the sort of, you can just see the, the things, the sort of seats by the pool there. This is the terrace where you have breakfast. And there's Etna, and sometimes it's just puffing smoke. Sometimes it's snow. red at night because it's actually doing a, a little mini show for us. You know. And, of course, the Greeks always chose perfect. So just behind... The hotel, yeah. you've got so, the amazing Greco Roman yeah. theatre. Yes. So. And you look from the same terrace, um, you know, there's, I mean, Etna's slightly gone to the side there, but uh, down the coast, the east coast of Sicily, off down towards Catania and Syracuse in the distance. And this place here, Giardini Naxos, was where the first Greek settlement in uh, Sicily was in the 8th century BC. And the Greeks moved out from Greece because there was nothing in Greece. It was all rocks and, you know, there wasn't much, much to offer. And they came to Sicily and it was big and fertile and full of water. And they, they discovered America. They discovered a big, just 
just the same way that the Europeans, when they first came across to, to America, discovered a land of immense promise where there were prairies where you could cultivate grain and uh, there was water and space. All these things the Greeks found in a small version in the 8th and 7th centuries when they came and settled uh, here. But maybe, I mean, having talked about hotels, would you like to say a word or two well, about this, hotels? This is a hotel where some of you have... Oh, yeah, some of you in this room will probably recognize this. We were there in November. Um, this is a, a very unusual hotel. And this is what, you know, our, our travel program is about. I mean, okay, the history and the geography for sure. I mean, these are really important things and understanding the cultural roots of where you're traveling. But also having hospitality of a very special kind, staying where possible. It's not always possible to find the perfect hotel, but where possible in marvelous hotels and eating really interesting uh, different kinds of food. And this is an interesting, I mean, apart from the fact that the place is interesting, it's a place called Siwa, which is in the Egyptian desert, almost at the border of Libya. Um, those, some of you who came, were rather astonished to discover that the State Department does not advise U.S. citizens to go there. But we went all the same, and we had a great fun, and it was absolutely uh, wonderful. It's an oasis. That's a lake in the middle of the Sahara Desert, an oasis of fresh water. Uh, it's a place which has all kinds of historical connotations, which I, I was you know, wanting to suggest it, because Alexander the Great came there, and he had a very important... Uh, prediction from the oracle of Siwa about his future. Anyway, this is not the moment to go into that, but we stayed in this hotel which is called the Adra Amelau, and it's won all kinds of um, uh, Aga Khan awards for architecture and ecological uh, architecture because, and, and this was, I think, a surprise for our travelers, there was no electricity. And Virtually now, there's a little bit of mobile signal, or pretty much nothing. No electricity. So you go to bed. When the night comes down with candles, they, they light fires to, to show you a way to your different rooms. And the rooms are all made by local craftsmen out of palm leaves and palm wood. Everything is as ecological. The bed you sleep on is made out of local produce. You know, it may not be the most comfortable night, but it's very, very memorable and very... And in silence, you see the night sky like you've never seen it before. It's, it, it's, it's a wonderful place. So we try also to include special experiences like that. And at the other end of the spectrum, this is an hotel that some of you came to Japan with me a few years back, may remember, on the, I think it was the 43rd, it may have been the 47th floor of a building in Osaka. Um, and you sort of teeter to the edge and look down and you see these little sort of, you know, things of the city below. And that's the lobby. That's where you check in. I, I, I mean, I, must say I found that a wonderful experience, completely the opposite end of the spectrum from the, from the, from the, from the last one uh, there. Uh, and you were mentioning Agrigento a moment ago. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's the Temple of Concord. Mm. Um, a wonderful hotel. I always worried because obviously some people would have views overlooking the temple. Some people would be overlooking the parking lot. But actually you sleep at night. You're supposed to sleep at night. So to be able to have dinner out on that terrace and enjoy and see the, the temple lit up at night is a magical experience. So there are these special places that are unforgettable. Unforgettable. I mean, Agrigento itself is a bit of a dump. It's a dump. It's a, you wouldn't want to, you want, you know, you wouldn't want to stay, want to stay in Agri the town. Um, and luckily, they've tidied this up. But I remember when I first went there, it was pretty grimy, and I even offered once to pay for trash, um, you know, because they were so disgusting. And I remember the old owner saying to me. Take it or leave it. And I'm sure he was a mafia boss at the time. But anyway, now uh, the younger generation have smartened it up. Of course, the prices have rocketed. But I'm sure you'll be staying there. I think we are, yeah. Yeah. And it, it is. But largely, thank, I mean, we're staying there thanks to your, 
you're having sort of established a relationship with them because it's a very small hotel. I mean, it's the only hotel in Agrigento that's in what's called the Valle dei, dei Templi, the, the Valley of the Temples, uh, which is a, a, an archaeological park, and you can't build anything more in it, so no more hotels are going to appear there. It's an old villa, and it's the only hotel there mm. near to the temples. But it only has, what, 20-something rooms? Mm, yes. And so a Santa Barbara group pretty much takes up the whole hotel. So they tend to say no at first, you know, when you ask them. But Susie has a, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I pay, pay dues. Oh, you do? Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you beat yeah. Actually, somebody once asked me if I paid dues in, in, uh, sure. in Sicily. Well, we won't, we won't press you on that. No, no. <laughs> well, I can assure you. You make very good friends. And so this is the, the thing about the Sicilians. If you respect them, they respect you, and you establish wonderful yes, working relationships and... Yeah. So a very different hotel, but those who are going to the Veneto will be staying in this hotel, the Villa Cipriani in Asolo, which is... Yes, that's where the tour starts. In, that, in, yes, and it's a lovely place to start, and it belonged to Robert Browning, and he wrote Asolando, which, and it was published on the day of his death mm. in 1896, I think it was, this, is, this hotel was built, it's, it's not Palladian, but you can see how it's been influenced by the Palladian style. So it was built in the, in the 1600s, um, and it was a private home. Then it became a hotel. It's been through various uh, owners, and now it's still, it's again privately owned, having been owned by the Chiga chain, which I'm sure a lot of you knew about Anyway, it's a lovely, it has a beautiful garden. Arzolo itself is a charming town, arcaded, excellent shopping, um, <laughs> which could be good or bad news, but um, a lovely place to start. Good so for you, bad news couldn't for be me, more yeah. different from the photograph that Nigel showed you first of the Egyptian hotel. Well, I mean, this is an hotel with a view. I mean, it yes. has a wonderful view because you're just up. I mean, when you leave Venice, obviously, the area is very flat immediately. But then you get to the edge of the foothills of the Alps and the land starts to rise. And mm. Asolo is on the first, as it were, knuckle, as it were, that begins mm. to rise up. And, uh, and so from the hotel, I haven't got a photograph of it, but if you were to turn through 180 degrees, you have this lovely view. And it's like looking over a sea, but you're in fact looking over the, the Venetian, the, the Po Valley, the Venetian mm. um, sort of hinterland flat below. So it's, it's a very serene place again to have breakfast. I mean, and there are some very memorable breakfasts in our, in our travels, <laughs> in, uh, I mean, on the terrace at the, and then Sicily, and then, and then here. And, and speaking of eating, um, it's not breakfast, but lunch. I'm sorry, I rather decapitated the. But I was so intent on photographing this beautiful <laughs> dish that I, you know. But this is in the at uh, that that hotel I mentioned in in Egypt, the Adria uh, Amelal, where all the produce is grown in the garden uh, that you eat. So they, you know, because they have the water of the oasis, they just plant things in the sand and water them, and they're wonderful quality. So what is that dish, Nigel? Oh, gosh. I, well, well, it was with eggplants and uh, tomato and these sort of um, beans and, uh, you know, like tabbouleh and delicious. and pomegranate. And it was just, just a salad. I mean, I don't mm. know, but it's so beautifully prepared. And, mm. and uh, I don't know. We... Very different place. This is... Near Perugia, a lovely garden and villa, and um, a memorable lunch. They're just preparing lunch under the plane trees. And they have, you can probably just see them in the corner. I know there's one there. The most beautiful terracotta pots that are at least 100 years old with, with some sculpt, sort of sculpted faces. They're wonderful. So a very serene moment. It was a very hot day, but a very enjoyable lunch. Yes, eating in a, in a historic and um, artistic landscape. Mm. And then something quite... <laughs> I think some of you remember this in Puglia, <laughs> in the 
This is a hotel called the Grotta Palazzese. And in the summer, you have the, the tables in the grotto there with the water lashing. It actually comes up on, this is a sort of bridge. So you have water on the other side as well. So very atmospheric. Uh, uh and not only sort of exciting place to eat, but being Apulia, I mean, wonderful food. I mean, yes. the south of Italy has this. I mean, so northern Italy has a great gastronomic condition, tradition, obviously, but rather sort of heavier on the stomach and the liver. Uh, but the south, I mean, uh, Apulia and, and Sicily and Calabria have such delicious fresh produce, and uh, it's, it's a much fresher cuisine. And wonderful yes, no wine. cream, no butter. Right. If you go to a supermarket in the south, it's totally different. You'll have shelves and shelves of tomatoes and things like that. Different, where kind, yeah. different kinds of cat. And in the north, of course, it's much more cream and, and butter. But you, you won't find butter at all, really, in... Uh, mm. Burrata, yes. Peter's mentioning burrata, which is now one of the most fashionable things. It's, it's everywhere. But once it was really something just from, from Puglia. It's a very, very rich mozzarella. Yes. It's extraordinary the way in which Italian things have sort of seeped. I mean, you know, this is, I don't know, is it a good or a, a bad thing about sort of international travel nowadays? You know, you can go to Vietnam or you can go to Bhutan or so. Botswana or whatever, and you still find cappuccino and uh, pizza and our Giorgio Armani, and nobody knows better how to sell themselves than the Italians. We all ought to take lessons, you know, from them. I mean, yes, it does get brilliant. transformed, though. I was yeah. rather surprised. But so this is my first time in California. So again, I want to thank Santa Barbara for for this wonderful invitation. But. Um, when you're in Italy, you know, pizza is usually tomato, olives, cheese. And here, I was very surprised to see chicken. I mean, everything on top of a pizza. Yeah. So, you know, things become imported, but they also get sort of modified and adapted yeah. and yeah. changed. Well, shall we, shall we open a... Oh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, there's a... Yes, at Palermo Market, yes, the Ballero Market, yes. Look at those yes. colours. Yes. And remember how many of these things have come from other parts of the world, but they've become unified in, in the Sicilian cuisine. I mean, the greatest marriage in, in the history of gastronomy is really between the eggplant, which came from Persia, brought by the Arabs into Sicily, and the tomato from the New World, uh, mm -hmm. brought also into Europe and to the, through Spain into Sicily. Uh, yeah, and that mixture of eggplant and tomato is obviously sort of mm -hmm. an immortal. Mouth-watering. You know. And of course, chocolate comes into Europe for the first time in cuisine through Sicily. But uh, moving on from these rather sensual matters, um, we, we just wanted to uh, just recall a few moments of surprise and serendipity which have happened on our tours, many of which you have been, uh, you, you, you'll remember. Uh, and, and tours not that far from home. Uh, Lisa had the brilliant idea of having some tours to Los Angeles when there was an interesting exhibition on or whatever. And I remember going on one uh, to LACMA, uh, to look at the German art, and then we went afterwards. I can't remember, what was the name of the gallery, Lisa, that you arranged for us to visit? I can't remember. Anyway, the LA Louvre, Louvre, that's it, that, that's it, that's it. We went there, um, and because we were wanting to look at the show of, of uh, David Hockney drawings and uh, things that were, was currently showing there. And we went in and we were just sort of talking with the, the, uh, the gallery curator in the room looking at these things. And he suddenly, you know, we were all gathered around him and he suddenly looked and said, oh, David, hello. And we all turned around and there was David Hockney himself wearing his characteristic cloth cap. He just walked into the room. And it was one of the most wonderful <laughs> moments to, I mean, it's probably the last time we'll, we'll see the poor fellow for, you know, because he doesn't go out much now, but he was But I'm sure that was arranged by Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah, you know, quite right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and, and in many ways, we, you know, we take advantage of things, and you never know when it's going to be the last time you see something or it may be suddenly become difficult. This is a tour uh, did quite some time ago. Many, not many of you here may have done it with me. I can't remember, to uh, southeastern Turkey. Gaziantep, we were involved, it was obviously sort of, I think it began in Ankara, and we went down into the uh, southeast of Turkey. Sorry, don't worry. Um, and it's an area, this beautiful town that you see in the slide there is called Mardin, and it's sort of like, almost like a Baroque town, uh, in this lovely sandstone, rather like something in Puglia in a way, or in mm. Sicily. Um, but, you know, there on the Syrian uh, Turkish border, this was our hotel where we stayed. Um, and when you turned around and looked the other way, this is what you saw. And it's on the hills which drop down to the border, the Turkish border there. And this is northeastern Syria, the sort of center of ISIS, as it was to become shortly afterwards, and now a completely no-go zone. So uh, we were lucky to go there just in time and to see that whole area completely peacefully in those days. And again, wonderful food, wonderful here. You may not think mm. in, in a Muslim country that you'd find a really good wine, but because there's a large Christian community in Mardin, they have a tradition of making a lovely red wine, which you don't drink out of glasses. You drink out of goblets made of tin that are shaped like cups. You know, it's very sort of rather like sort of something ancient and pagan. And mm. there. So that, that's Mardin. And, and near there, we were very lucky not only, you know, to see the area before it became uh, dangerous, but we were sort of in on one of the early discoveries, well, you know, this is early stages of one of the most important recent archeological um, discoveries of the Western Hemisphere, which is a place called Gerbekli Tepe, uh, which means potbelly hill in Turkish. Um, but this stone ring, uh, goes back to 9,500 BC, so 11,000 years old. So it is the oldest sort of architectural formation that has so far been discovered. And not only is that, but these standing stones are carved actually quite beautifully. But, uh, I mean, there are, there are lots of lovely carved stones, but these are pretty old. At 9,000 BC. So that's a, I mean, that's a place to watch. It's being um, uh, excavated by a German, Klaus Schmidt, who with the German Archaeological Institute. And uh, he has some very interesting theories, which you can look at online, about what it is actually that he's discovered, which is then much challenged by other archaeologists. But you know, that's, that's the, the food of archaeology. So. And, and there it is. Uh, that's Gerbekli Tepe, where we were. That's Mardin, where the Atel was that's the Syrian border there. This is Raqqa, which you probably heard about quite a bit in the news. Aleppo, whoops, there, and so, you know, Iraq, and here. It was sort of, you know, a, but it was a wonderful, wonderful visit. And my goodness, talking of food, you know, Turkish food is, is wonderful. And this is rather a sad story. Yeah. I think some of you came to Norcha. Yes. And I don't know how long afterwards. Do you remember? Well, not I mean, long after, yeah. The church and and the town itself was almost razed to the ground. By I mean, an earthquake, yeah, terrible earthquake. We stayed in a lovely hotel, and think, and that, it hasn't been rebuilt. the The facade, I think, has remained. All that remains was I went earlier this last year with another group, um, in, in right in the sort of Apennines, in the sort of spine of Italy. This is the Abbey of St. Benedict. St. Benedict, I mean, one of the most important of all early uh, saints, Italian saints, and the patron saint of Europe. Because in a way, for many reasons, he was instrumental in s helping Europe survive after the collapse of the Roman Empire. St. Benedict was born in a Roman house underneath this church. And therefore, this was the a place dedicated to St. 
from Benedict, a very, very important individual. Well, when I went the other day, this, this all propped up with steel scaffolding, survives. All this has gone. That tower has gone. The, sphere, the, sp the square is just full of cranes. I mean, it's... it's and this yeah. was, what, three years ago yeah, at least? Yeah. Three or four, no, I mean, more. They, they more. will rebuild it. Those of you who've been to Assisi again will remember that that is, was felled by a or well, the east end of Assisi, the basilica, was felled by a, by a, a earthquake, but that they've restored, restored it absolutely perfectly, and that will happen. But, you know, so, you know, you never know when you travel somewhere what... Um, yeah. uh, on, on, on a happier note, surprises, you know, do you want to say a word about... I mean, this is... I don't know if you uh, recognise, this is the Amalfi Coast, Ravello, yeah. beautiful, beautiful town very unspoilt, very close to Naples. And, and the area between the Amalfi Coast and Naples itself, of course, is, has been built up and is so unattractive. And this is a coastline that's been beautifully preserved. If we, and there is Naples, which in many ways hasn't changed this part of nature. This is Spacca Napoli. Totally unchanged. Coming over here, actually, I saw a wonderful film called Nostalgia. And it, it's the man comes back to Naples after 40 years, having lived in Beirut, and he says, nothing's changed. <laughs> However, if you want to show the next photograph. This is the Naples underground, the metro. The, metro. the new metro that isn't really spoken about, but... A number of very important architects have worked on the stations. You could eat off the ground, spotlessly clean, and totally unexpected and hardly spoken of. Yeah, and, and a lot of important, I mean, even well-known knights at Kentridge did uh, a lot of the mosaics in some of the stations. Um, and, and it's not, you know, you, you are thinking about Naples is that, you know, the washing hanging out and the sort of impossible vespers and and sort of back and snatching being and mugged all that, and being mugged and all that. And yet the, the underground, this is the, escal the escalator going up. Um, and in fact, it changes color as you go up and you have various works of art on the way. I mean, and there's people going to work in, in the town of Naples. You know, so, I mean, what we're trying to do is just sort of talk a little bit about the serendipity and the surprises that you find here. And this just reminds me of something that those of you came to Japan with me because as we... Yeah, we, we, do you remember the museum, I think it was called yeah. MoMA in Atami, where you sort of park in a bus at the bottom and the museum is at the top of the mountain and you go up in seven successive escalators and each time you come up to a domed room with a new display of floral colours above it or something. And, you know, I mean, it's, uh, entries to Japanese museums, well, Japanese museums are are unforgettable, once seen, never, never forgotten. That's a very particular, it's just it's sort of similar to the metro, but um, this is not a, for vehicles at all, this is the way in which you as a pedestrian enter a museum which is sort of not far from Kyoto called the Miho, uh, private museum. You park and you walk through this sort of curving stainless steel tunnel and then at the exit, you walk across a sort of bridge over a gorge, and you begin to see the museum ahead. And you go into the building opposite with this lovely circular door there, and you come into a lobby where you are at the top of a mountain with just forest and pine trees around. I mean, it's, a, it's a lovely thing, you know, that's sort of <laughs> rather different from the, the picture we began with, with people going up the escalator so this is, was a, is a really, it puts you in the mood for looking at the art. Okay, when you go up in the escalator into the Vatican, you see the Sistine Chapel and half the world's treasures, whether they're Egyptian or Roman or Greek or Renaissance or whatever, in that museum. In this museum, you see small things, not, not, they're not in the sort of main stream of art history books, but they're so beautifully exhibited in this mm. sort of lovely space. It's a, a uh, real pleasure. And Japan, yes, offers, offers these wonderful visions of, of nature seen from inside architecture.
And Susie, when, when we were looking at that slide, slide sort of said, contrast that with, with this. This is nature seen through a different window. This is, of course, in the Alhambra. Is it the Alhambra? No. Alhambra, yeah, yes, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of the course... Differences of cognition. I mean, this yeah. is the world seen through Japanese eyes. This is the world seen through, through Arab eyes. And how important gardens are. Gardens to everyone, yes. To everyone. Yeah. One always includes gardens in, in any tour because people love to see a garden. And they vary so much. They're often a reflection of the owner's taste. There's a wonderful garden. Where's Tenryuji. that? Where's the Tenryuji? Yeah, it's just outside in, in uh, Arashima, just outside uh, Kyoto. Lovely guy. I remember us sitting on the on the on the steps of the temple, wooden steps of the temple behind, and talking about I don't know the symbolism of the gardeners. Yes, and then that's that's a Japanese way of reorganizing nature into an aesthetic home. This is this is somewhere that you introduced me to. It's yes, lovely... Villa di Giorgiano, just outside Siena. And this is a sort of a theater where they often have concerts. Mm. It's in the shadow there, but there's lovely mm. cypresses. And a green garden. Mm. And then and a then dinner. In his, we had a dinner in his kitchen afterwards, yes. I seem to remember. And some of you may recognize this, the Biviere, the wonderful garden of Principessa Borghese. In Sicily. Yeah, in between Catania and... And she's still alive. And that was complete, that was marsh. It was nothing, it was a lake that was reclaimed. And her husband suddenly, I mean, the Borghese, of course, came from Rome, but they were also living in Palermo, and he suddenly announced, I want to go and live in, the, and she came there, and it was wasteland. And in fact, you drive through wasteland to get to it. She said, well, what am I going to do? She said, I'm going to create a garden. And she created this wonderful garden, had to try with various plants. She went traveling. And it was difficult because there's a, a, a great difference in temperature, the heat of the day and the, and the very cold at night it can be. Anyway, she created this magical garden. And um, the Queen Mother went there. And then she thought, well, if it's good enough for the Queen Mother, maybe I can open it to... <laughs> To, and, and I took a group there, actually an Italian group for the first time. And so wonderful having lunch in the garden. Served by her, who kind of Served sits by her well. and by Vanda, no, not Vanda, Fiamma, Ferragamo, because the Ferragamos had a property nearby. So F Fiamma Ferragamo was handing you your pasta, which was quite. Unexpected, serendipitous, yeah, <laughs> surprise. A little gift of Ferragamo shoes at the end of it. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, another garden which was created ex novo, uh, we visited, I'll show you in a second, but this is the owner, uh, Marc René de Montalembert and his wife uh, there. We, when this was a, a garden created inside the walls of the medieval city of Rhodes, in commemoration of their young son, who at the age of 23 disappeared in a sailing accident somewhere between the island of Rhodes and the Turkish coast. And they bought a little church dedicated to his, the boy was called Mark, uh, St. Mark, and created a garden. There's a, the dome of the little church of St. Mark, or there was an Ios Marcos, and they created this Ottoman garden you know, with hedgerows and water. And it's largely a white garden because it's a remembrance garden, so all the flowers are white. Um, and uh, that was uh, yeah, with Santa Barbara. Many people who are even in this room. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Susan, you wanted to say a little bit about decoration and architecture. Well, how it can really vary. I mean, here is such a plain decoration in this wonderful cathedral that we saw before. Syracuse Cathedral. Syracuse, yes. But with a wonderful little statue there and these sort of eastern lamps. And then, totally different. 
the wonderful Byzantine mosaics in Monreale. Extraordinary because created by, created by invaders. Created, I mean, the island of Sicily, which had been there for long enough with the ancient Greeks and then the Byzantine Empire and then the, the Arabs and so forth, and along come these mercenaries. There's a, there's a problem between the Arabs, you know, one group and another on the island, and so they pick up the telephone in 800 AD and call for the best mercenaries in Europe, who happen to be the northern French Normans in Normandy. And they come down, but they rather like what they sort of mop up the problem and like what they were see in Sicily. So they decide to stay. And extraordinary for mercenary people from another part of Europe, they create a very tolerant culture uh, in which um, the Arabs, Jews, Christians live, cohabit beautifully and easily in Palermo. And these magnificent, some of the most beautifully decorated interiors in, in, in Italy. This is Monreale, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And there again, the Arabs. Everybody Another. knows where this is, the <laughs> forest of columns. But yeah. three very different cathedrals. Mm. But all three of them very beautiful and very moving. I mean, you know, you walk in there and you suddenly get... Yes, this is... This is uplifting. I mean, you get a, an amazing experience and sense of... Uh, and this is what... I mean, okay, this is what the tours, are, in a way, are about. You can look at architecture as long as you can on, in pictures and in books, and you don't get the point. When you go there, some of you will have heard me say, measure your pulse before you go over the, <laughs> over the doorstep. You know, when you go into Santa Sofia in Istanbul, just feel your pulse before you go in and notice how it changes when you go into that huge space and your head goes up into the, look into the dome. When you, as Susie's saying, go into this. Again, these things have a physical effect on you. They change your, your, uh, um, your, your mood, your pulse rate, whatever. And this is how one comes to understand what great architecture is. This is why we travel to see it. You can't understand architecture. Elsewhere. Sorry, yeah. Cordoba. Cordoba, southern Spain, not far from Seville. Um, if you go sort of due south of Madrid, uh, in what the Andalusian province of, of Spain. Yeah. Sort of halfway between Seville and Granada. An area which was under Arab domination for several hundred years. Yes. Yeah, it was yeah. later turned into a Christian cathedral, yeah. So you get an initial impression, and then you have somebody like Nigel, who tells yeah. you the history of, of the building. I and, just ask people to measure their pulses. And, and then it becomes, <laughs> no, no, you don't. And then it becomes so much more meaningful, and you understand. Mm. Uh, that's, yeah, part of it. I mean, what a... I mean, again, showing a photograph is not fair because you need to stand under, underneath that and feel this. Wonderful. The, the craftsmanship. This is the same church. I mean, the mosque, what's called the Mesquita in Cordoba, southern Spain. Oh, there's something completely different there. Yeah, this is... A, yeah. No, but this is... Um, just remind me, Nigel. This is Amalienborg. This yeah, is Amalienborg in, in the uh, Nymphenburg uh, Palace in Schloss in, in yeah. Munich, outside Munich. We went, uh, and it, some of you went there. Uh, it, lovely from the outside, but the extraordinary thing is the decoration inside. inside. Look at that. That's just a detail of it. Rococo but, at but again, its best. But again, there, you can look at that and you think, well, gosh, that's, mm -hmm, that's really nice decoration. But to stand in the room with it all around you mm. and to feel the sort of joy of the decoration and, you know, the... The, the masterfulness of the relief creation of these you know, things. It's a different, my, a different world. You know. This is the interesting thing. You know, Cordoba is one mindset. This is another mindset. And until we understand, you know, I, I always feel, you know, if I were a penguin in a zoo, which sometimes I do feel rather like a penguin in a zoo, <laughs> I, I, I would sort of want to fly out of my compound and go look at the giraffes. And go and look at the elephants and the bears and all that and realize that there are 
other realities than being a penguin in a zoo in, you know, in, with all the other penguins, you know. I mean, the problem is if we, if we, if we were to stay all of us, I mean, I know none of you are, have come from a kind of a simple one monotheme sort of life, but, you know, if we stay where we are, you know, we, we don't discover that there are bears and lions and giraffes as well as the penguins that we live with. So. Um, oh, yeah, that's another one, yeah. Vienna. Yeah, I think I, we just put on the, on, the in, on the itinerary that we would go and visit the incinerator, <laughs> the garbage incinerator when visiting Vienna. Uh, but it's one hell of a, an incinerator, uh, decorated and designed by a man called Hundert Wasser, a fascinating ecological sort of minded artist who had very interesting theories about that... Um, you know, we shouldn't have flat floors in our house because we are human beings. We are originally sort of simians. Um, we're, you know, we're used to walking on uneven earth and that we should have that in our houses. It's a bit difficult to imagine and having closets and tables. And, anyway, yeah. and then, you know, not just buildings, but whole towns can be. Uh, this is Lecce in the south of, of Sicily. Are we going on too long here? I think we've got to speed up. Que uh, hora non putatis, nil inchatus. Nothing is more uncertain than as the hour uh, which you do not know, the hour in which you die. Mm. Every time you go in and out of that door, you uh, are faced with that. So enough of our burbling on that. The most important and crucial part of all these tours is yourself. And, uh, you know, without you and without your curiosity and your input, um, you know, and... That's so Judy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very Ken and Laura as well. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, this is obviously in Japan, all about Yayoi Kusama's uh, spotty, spotty thing there. There we are uh, waiting for a ferry, I think. And um, Judy is saying, where's the ferry? <coughs> um, but without, without you, and without, I mean, I really mean this, without your comments. I mean, I, I can't remember so many of the things that I've kind of, picked up and learned from and things that you've, you've asked. But, I mean, I'm just brought in mind of, of, of just in Egypt. And um, Leslie, uh, who, who took some wonderful photographs on that trip, at one point said to me after we'd sort of when they maxed out on pyramids and tombs, he said, why did all this so sort of disappear and end? You know, what happened to it all in the end? And it's... A, it's a very, it's a very interesting question. I didn't know what to say to him really. But since then, I've been thinking about it ever since, and I'd really rather like to write a book about what has happened at the end of, of 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 Egyptian history and how it morphs into what is Greek. Because the Greeks come to Egypt, they learn from Egypt, and they take back to Greece something. You know, I mean, it's an interesting thing. But your input is so important, apart from the fact that you're such good company and good fellow trenchermen and, and, and all that. There we are in Egypt, looking, wait, waiting for a sunset barbecue in the desert. Uh, and sometimes, oops, you know, things, things can't always work yeah. perfectly. Uh, here's a group of rather disconsolate looking uh, uh, Santa, Barber uh, Santa Barbarans, because, Santa Barbarans uh, because our flight from uh, Paros International Airport, the huge airport of Paros, which you can see consists of one room, um, had been uh, cancelled and uh, there was a storm and we couldn't get back to Athens. But I mention this group because a lovely thing happened while we were waiting, you know, is the flight going to go, is it going to go, or not. I had been talking the day before, I'm sorry, this is me pontificating about a really beautiful bronze, rare bronze, full-sized uh, Kouros figure, the god Apollo. Um, he was found in a sewer in Piraeus in 1958. 
Um, it's thought that he was being moved in ancient times, probably in Roman times, take, being taken from Greece. Mm. He was probably originally at Delphi, being taken to Rome. Uh, and something happened in the port. Maybe there was a fire in the port of Piraeus. And he was forgotten and built over. And then when they were making a new sewer, they discovered him. And marvelous, because we have so few bronzes remaining. From that. Anyway, I'm talking about that there. And people were saying, Gosh, did the Greeks really have hairstyles like that? You know, we were talking about the, the kouros, typical kouros, heads, head, head, head style, it's sort of almost plaited like that. And I said, well, you know, don't know. We are, I sort of guess they did. And then while we were waiting at Paros Airport, somebody <laughs> took this photograph and said, yes, there's the baggage handler. He has the kouros hairstyle. <laughs> so it was, a, you know... I, I, I'm very grateful to whoever it was who took the picture and noticed. So, so things really do, you know, sink in. And sometimes we have surprises at the, the dinner table. Here is, I think, the, is the chair of your board, Nick yeah. Mutton yeah, and see. Victoria there. And uh, they were both rather amused that we had an extra guest at the table there, a town with a cat in the background. <laughs> No, this yeah, is there we are, yeah, many of you there this at the is, end of Puglia. Uh, last evening in Puglia, and I was presented with a booklet um, inviting me to Santa Barbara. And so here I am, and I can't thank you enough for this wonderful experience. First time in California, first time in Santa Barbara. I'd heard so much about it, and I... I think the thing that impressed me most about the town was its human dimension. And it, it's very livable, and that you have so much in Italy too. Um, but it's also the hospitality that I've received. So I think Nigel and I are eternally grateful to all of you for taking us to wonderful places. Yes, to, to, to Shelley for founding this. And for Lisa, and for Lisa, Lisa, come and join us. Because we want just to finish by saying a word or two about the, the future. And no one knows about the future except you do. And so please come and... There's a chair here, dear. Oh, you need my table. Oh, you need your table. Okay. A table so I can have my wonderful cup that Nigel just gave to me. And those two cups that they're drinking from are from Shelley Rustin, who gave them to me when I got married. <laughs> and that's something I would just love to say, is that with this job, I make friends, not just colleagues. And the two of them feel like colleagues more than people who work in this building. Um, but they also are friends. And Shelly is a great friend. My coworkers, Jen and Hisu, um, who just started last week. But <laughs> they're, all, they're all friends. Um, and people around the world that we've met have become such wonderful friends. And you and you have taken us to such wonderful places. So it's just really such a pleasure to have you here in Santa Barbara and be able to give a little bit of that, that back to you. Yeah. And this must have been, it must have been recently a difficult time for you with COVID. I mean, COVID has been something that's taught us all, well, it taught us many things. I mean, Pico has just produced this book uh, that's just come out very recently, Pico Aya, talking about, um, you know, how it's concentrated all our minds on what we're doing in life and, and whether, you know, and, and, and death and, and these, these matters. But COVID also made us realize how much travel means to us all. Mm -hmm. And uh, for you, Lisa, I'm just thinking, it, it, I mean, it must have been a very difficult time when suddenly everything came screeching to a halt. Yes, it sure did. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was difficult, unraveling all the um, reservations the we had yes, made. Because and... you work on a program a year and a half at least before it actually happens, so you had... How many tours did you have that was about to go? Probably five that spring, and of course all the travelers on all those tours wondering what would happen and mm. um, whether it would go or not go at first, and then when we realized things weren't going to go, what that, how that would unravel and the finances. It was 
One of the more most challenging, challenging yes. times. <laughs> Whether we would ever sure. get to be traveling again yeah. in, in the way that we, 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 we've been doing and we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what, do you want to finish but with some words yes. about the future and what you'd like to do, where you'd like us to go, or where, <laughs> where people in the audience would like to go? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, it's it's neat to see travel coming back. And I think it's something that all of us love so much that we had to get through those couple of years, but it's not going away permanently because mm. there's just something so special about going on these trips and um, it won't, won't go away. So yeah, we have a full year coming up with lots of wonderful destinations and these are we all know I'll embarrass them, but these are our two top, top leaders. Um, but I try so much to find other wonderful leaders. So we have um, Rocky Ruggiero, who I actually had as a college professor when I was abroad in Siena, leading a trip for us this spring. Um, and there will be a Sistine Chapel private visit. Mm -hmm. And um, Justin Cami, who I met on a cruise, he's a Smith professor. I just think he's uh, fabulous, and he's doing a trip to Poland and uh, Prague and Berlin and Dresden. And then we have Keelan Overton, an Islamic arts historian who's doing three tours with us to um, Armenia and Georgia, Morocco, and I think we have to do three of those tours because there's so much interest in it. Um, and then mm. the Silk Road, which is a private air um, airplane, so it's about 50,000. It's one of the more pricey ones, but that's the way to see the Silk Road. Um, and a few other wonderful tour leaders. So that's, um, they, they, you make the trip. <laughs> um, and as do all of you too. It's, it's, as I said, been wonderful to find friends in tour leaders, find friends in the travelers, and then find friends all over the world. Susie and Nigel both talked about Bhutan, and I've been there twice, once with a group and once doing some scouting, and really connected with our guide there. Mm -hmm. And after I had my first baby, he, my, a boy, he had his first baby boy a year later. So since then, I've sent him four boxes of hand-me-downs, which is a <laughs> nice. challenge to send boxes to Bhutan. It's almost like every time there's some new challenge, like they, FedEx won't do it, or they, so, but he's really, they've all made it there, and he's really appreciated that. So it's, it's neat to have those connections, and that's what, what keeps me on the job. Um, and then at our travel party, if you're a past traveler, hopefully you're coming tomorrow night, we'll be revealing our 2024 oh, tours okay. for the first time. Um, but one of them, I'll just tell you now, I, I grew up in Hawaii and we'll have a trip to Honolulu. Marie Paul did the trip to Honolulu, the only other time I did it in 2012. And that was, that was really special to take people around there to the Dorstuka State, mm -hmm. which has Islamic art um, and the Honolulu Art Museum and all over private homes and things like that in, in Honolulu. So that's one I'm really excited to start planning again um, and, and repeating that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a very ambitious and wonderful program. And what about questions from the audience? Yes, yes, Linda. Linda well, is right, Oaxaca I didn't mention. Really? Linda just said Oaxaca was one of the best trips she'd yeah. ever wow. done with us in Mexico with, uh, with Florencio Moreno. I'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. Good to know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you on it. I mean, not to lead it, but just to <laughs> listen, yeah, to go and listen yeah. Yeah. to Oaxaca, yeah. Let me, may I speak for everyone in the audience, I think? Um, a few years ago, I read about uh, a study at Harvard that they were doing about happiness, about what really makes people happy. And it turned out it's not really money. If you have enough money for a roof over your head or food to feed your family, that's probably good enough. It's not stuff. What makes people happy is memorable experiences. Mm. And we want to thank both of you, Susie, your Susie and dear Nigel, 
for giving us so many memorable experiences. Oh my goodness, this is very emotional for me. <laughs> um, you are both truly artists. Nigel, through your erudition and your extraordinary gift of storytelling that mm -hmm. weaves so many th threads that help us understand the world and see it and feel it uh, in new ways. Oh, thank you. Very and Susie, your extraordinary gift for friendship, for the connections, for your exquisite taste. Um, thank you both so much for giving us so many opportunities to be happy. And just the, the little, a little postscript also, more recently I read about the importance of wonder, that following our curiosity and cultivating a sense of wonder is so important, not just for um, our well-being, but actually even for longevity. So thank you for giving mm. us the gift of long life as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Many thank blessings. You. Yeah. Thank you. And, and thank you, Jill, for bringing us together. I mean, oh. you know, and insisting on that. That was, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, if, if anyone has some questions that they'd like to ask, I'll bring around the microphone and can share so everyone can hear. <laughs> Susie, where was that restaurant in Apulia where we went for lunch? One of the best lunches we've ever had. In the middle, in the middle of nowhere. It's a multi-course lunch. Right. Which yes, I remember. The one that is on the way to the, in Basilicata, just on the way between Puglia and Basilicata. I think Barata again. Oh. You remember, it's sort of kind of no place town we went to. We were on our way to. Uh, oh. You it, blanked. Yes. I've blanked on it. It's not the hotel, no. no. It was out in the country. Yeah. Oh, near Ostuni. No. Was it out? It was a private home or a no, restaurant? No. no, it was a restaurant. So it was a restaurant. It was in a sort of two-horse town on the way into Basilicata. And I can't remember, I mean, you're, you're absolutely Gosh, right. That you've wasn't. really floored me, because usually I can remember every restaurant. I love food. Yeah, well, so. I, I, I apologize for my colleague, Susie. She has so many good meals, she can't sort of distinguish one. Yes, in fact, another. you can see. <laughs> Yeah. Course after course after course. Yeah. We'll, we'll find it. We'll find it. Do you know, I can't remember the name of the place either. Um, we were on our way to see that place where the Norman kings were buried uh, in on the edge of. Uh, oh, Castel del Monte. No, Sorry. No, 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 not. Not near we'll Castel look it up on, uh, where, where, on the itinerary and get back yeah. to all of anyway, you. That's <laughs> Satisfy everyone's anyway, curiosity. Uh, Graham, did you want to ask anything specific about that place? <laughs> 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 I, just, I, just, I love the way it looked. I remember all the wood and all the, the length of yeah. it. It was a long restaurant. Yeah. 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 And lots of handcrafted things everywhere. That's right. They grew there. Yeah. And endless yeah. courses of wonderful food. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I just want to be able to find it again. <laughs> well, uh, I'll go through the itinerary and I'll, I'll let you know, Graham, with I've pleasure. I've managed to capture the microphone. If you can hear me up there. Yes. yes. Very yes. simple question. You've had an amazing experience in your professional and personal life. If you could only go on one oh. final trip. Oh. 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 I would love to hear what you would choose. This is a kind of accelerated bucket list. <laughs> Uh, well, feel free to make do a couple of them. No, but I mean, it, 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 I think it would be to Bhutan actually yeah. again. Um, simply, I mean, I, I would love to go to Japan again. I mean, the the Orient I find it fascinating because it's a different sort of mindset from from ours, and, and it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, ac the emphasis on beauty. But the whole experience of Bhutan, the combination of landscape. Mm. And I uh, mentioned too that the trip that we went on from the museum had not only Bhutan, but Tibet and Nepal. And that amazing contrast 
Yeah. Yeah, Nepal. The other, yeah. Other things we flew over Mount Everest. Yeah. And Everest and had a clear view. It was magnificent. Wow. It was just amazing. Mm. Susie, where would you? Well, I have to say, I found Bhutan. You know, you get off the airplane, you breathe the air. I, I was sort of spellbound by it, mm. and so it has. And in fact, I was supposed to return. This is an old story. But I insisted on, I was supposed to do Bhutan in 2020, and then it was canceled. But I wanted to do it, and so I am doing Bhutan this year. But anybody um, who hasn't been should, should go. It is a magical place, a really magical place. I'd love to go to Japan. I mean, I've got, Nigel's well tra more well-traveled mm -hmm. than I am, but I think Japan sounds incredible, but I wonder, can you do it in one trip? I mean, it sounds... No, there are so many different Japan. Yeah. The Spice Islands is another area which, well, I've been to once, but I'd like to go back to again, where the nutmeg trees originally came from, where the, where the, the clove trees originally were. They're, they are very, very beautiful. They're the, the history of the, is in a way sort of sad, uh, you know, the exploitation that the West did to them, but they're, very, very beautiful, indeed. That's a difficult question, Dale, but yep. thank you for asking. Where question. would you go, Dale? What would your, your final? The Bhutan trip was outstanding. Uh, we went on a trip, it wasn't a museum trip, to Iran. Yes. Opening it goes, they're an amazing civilization. Yeah, I know. Preserved, mm -hmm. like Egypt, yeah. Because of the climate. It would and be lovely to go. Yeah. On the other hand, there's also a plus, too. If you think you might have a drinking problem, after two weeks of no alcohol whatsoever, you probably don't. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Nigel, uh, where was the photo taken of the Kasama sculpture with the pyramid in the background? Where was the photo? Oh, yeah, yeah, on the yes, the so-called uh, art islands in Naoshima. Oh, okay. Naoshima, Teshima. I remember Teshima in particular, which I didn't have a photograph of, in which there is only one sort of major installation, that sort of white, undulating, strangely womb-shaped, but also like a pantheon with an opening to the sky, this sort of space you go into, and there are little droplets of resin which run around. I mean, I remember it bewitching everybody. I mean, I'm you know, a bit skeptical of installations. I'm sorry to say, but I'm an old grouch, but um, I was very moved by that, and I think everybody uh, was when we went into that. It is, those art islands are remarkable. But, uh, ver Japan offers such a variety of different sorts of experience, and of course you can go to the North Island and have an alpine experience, and, you know, and, uh, and the gardens, I mean, the, to spend an hour or two in a couple of Japanese gardens, it's like going for a, you know, a, you know, on a cure, a cure holiday for about two weeks. You know, they can do anything in a cure, but nothing can really put you back together, really, you know, in balance and visiting a Japanese garden and thinking about it and sitting in it for, for an hour. That's a wonderful place, Japan, yeah. Yeah, that was my first tour with the museum. Shay? For my first tour with the museum in 2008 was right. to Japan. Yeah, yeah. And when I found out that Charlie Munger and his whole family was going, I was even more nervous to go on my first tour, but they were lovely people. And I love that you showed the photos of the Miho Museum and how you walked mm -hmm. through that tunnel. That was my favorite. But yeah. the um, Naoshima Island is just so special as well. Yeah. They built that museum and, ho and hotel, and then kind of all ships rise with the tide, so to speak, and all these other islands started to develop art installations. And art is, I think, infectious that way. You know, it, what Donald Judd tra travels to Marfa, and then all these other um, artists want to come to Marfa, Texas. So it, it's, mm. it inspires other artists nice, and yeah. grows and grows, inspires us. Any other questions? Maybe one more? If not... <laughs> Everywhere we go.
Santa Barbara Cafe with the, with the gelato. Well, anyway, I mean, it's really our thanks to you, not you to us. I mean, you know, we, yeah. you, know, you sustain the program and you, you, know, you are all wonderful to travel with. So we, we, Susie and I and Lisa, thank you for your support. Yes, and your and, friendship and, and hospitality. Friendship. And, a, and a word of thanks also to Jen, and to Jen. who had yeah. baptism by fire, right, <laughs> in Spain, yeah. when the group came down with COVID. Yeah. And Jen had only been working at the museum for a few months, and, and she got it too, but worked from her hotel room, making oh. sure everyone was on task with the additional tests and all that it was it, that was yeah, that was a challenge but she did a great job with it it was my pleasure it's uh, yeah. coming up on a year and it's been uh, a wonderful year of meeting many new friends uh, and it's been a lot of fun this week getting to see all of you here together and reminiscing on trips you've taken with each other so thank you for being here thank you